I want to talk about the guy that designed uh, the Lovell telescope, Sir Bernard Lovell. He's an amazing man. So he went from being this very average people at school to somebody that ended up excelling in the areas of maths and physics. Eventually went to university and eventually he became a lecturer at Bristol. Then he was uh, basically told he, need, he needed to branch out. And he didn't want to go to Manchester University, but it was his second choice. But nevertheless, he ended up at Manchester University reluctantly. And ultimately, he settled in at Manchester University. Um, but he wasn't there that long before the Second World War broke out. And he was called to be a part of a top secret operation, which would work on the early warning radar systems down on the south coast there for the for the raids that would come over from the uh, German Luftwaffe. And Sir Bernard Lovell was uh, right in the middle of all this and he began to learn at that time about radio waves and how important radio waves were for um, spotting incoming aircraft from Germany, how the radio waves would bounce off the planes and eventually they could plan and plot exactly where these raids were gonna come from. So Bernard was very much in the middle of that with a team of other people and when they'd kind of finally tuned that, Bernard and his team were asked to then take this, these huge ra uh, radio wave detectors and shrink them down so that they could fit into bombers. So that they could accurately bomb the cities in Germany. Now Sir Bernard Lovell was a Christian and he loved God and he didn't have a problem with defending our nation uh, you know and putting up helping with the early warning radar systems but he had a problem with going on the offensive and bombing innocent people in Germany and he was constantly uh, struggling in his own conscience with this until his wife's home town of Bath was pretty much flattened or semi flattened by two uh, air raids that happened at the time and it was because of that that he realized if we don't if we don't get our bombing accuracy right uh, with our bombers in the Second World War, we're gonna lose the war. So eventually him and his team worked on a scaled down version of, of, uh, of a, um, a, a, a radio transmitter that would help them to see the coastlines of Germany and also the cities at night. And Sir Bernard and his team were very successful in this it was uh, Sir Winston Church and himself that kind of almost threatened Sir Bernard by saying if you don't get so many of these machines made, fitted into the bombers, but it, within six months you'll have me to deal with and uh, like his team just really uh, nailed it and they scaled down the, the machinery needed and uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a massive thing. Then he was asked to take the same equipment to be put in the nozzle of a plane to be able to detect German U-boats in the middle of the night. It was an incredible thing. But after sheer hard work and total dedication in exhausting uh, situations and circumstances, they designed a radar system that would fit into the nozzle of the bombing aircraft which they used to detect U-boat. And of course, it was incredibly successful. The last thing that he, he did is he used this technology to be able to detect the B-1 rockets uh, that Hitler was going to use from his point of view to hopefully end the war and finally destroy England and of course it didn't work and Sir Bernard's men and his team were very much instrumental at that time in flattening many of the V-1 rockets that were uh, used in the Second World War. If it wasn't for Sir Bernard Lovell and his team it, it could be argued that we would have lost uh, the Second World War. He, at the end of the war, the man was completely exhausted and really needed a huge rest. He went back to Manchester University and um, within no time he wanted to use radio waves and everything that he'd learned about radio waves to, to begin to point it up at the skies and try and find out what this life is all about, what the universe is all about. When he was at uh, Manchester University, he was looking for somewhere where he could kind of measure particles in the ionosphere and tried to set up a lot of experiments in Manchester. But because of the, the, the sparks that came off the trams 
um, there was just so much interference that it, it just couldn't be done. And one day, uh, one of the chaps that was working there said, have you heard about the piece of ground that they've got um, on, in the Cheshire Plains? Which has not really been used for anything at the moment. I think it was horticultural stuff. I'm not really sure, but he came along to have a look at this. This was just field. So it was from here with a bunch of scaffold poles and primitive equipment and one cement mixer. It was so primitive, uh, but it was from here that Sir Bernard uh, became really the cutting edge in radio astronomy. <laughs> you can't really believe it, but in this field, we just kind of, there's just hodgepodge equipment. Um, he, he became the cutting edge in radio astronomy. After incredible hard work and utter dedication, um, he managed to convince the universities that they needed to fund it. So I think the, the initial, uh, the, the initial uh, um, estimate for building this was £50,000. And I think it went up to something like eight times that price, which was an awful lot back then. But nevertheless, this thing, this enormous thing that we see here, came into being and it became uh, instrumental into observing the universe. The, the, the point of, 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 of why I'm so excited about Sir Bernard Lovell is that he was a dedicated Christian. He believed the Bible. No two ways about it. He believed that the Bible was God's word for mankind. But it never stopped him um, from being a first-rate first rate scientist. It never stopped him from, uh, and being a scientist never stopped him from being a devout Christian. Uh, that he could hold both tensions together. In fact, he believed that they kind of bled over into one another. And that's why I find this guy so exciting. Because here he is, a first-rate scientist that helped to put up what was in its day the biggest telescope in the world, that believed in science, believed in the laws of gravity, electromagnetism, the stronger weak nuclear force, of course, the electromagnetic spectrum, which this is a part of. So you've got the radio waves, you've got the uh, microwave, you've got the infrared, you've got that thin sliver of light called invisible light, you've got ultraviolet light, you've got x-ray and gamma ray, and he was one of the first ones to say, hey, let's stop looking at the universe only in visible light. Let's look at the universe using radio waves. And this guy was a devout Christian, and that's why I find him so interesting. So, so interesting. Because we're told today that you can't be a Christian and believe in science. That the two are a contradiction. They have nothing to do with one another. Well, the truth is that many scientists big guns as well not just like small fry but big guns they believed in God Isaac Newton believed in God where would we be without Newton's laws of gravity and motion where would we be you can look at people like James Clark Maxwell where would Einstein be without James Clark Maxwell's equations well James Clark Maxwell believed in God he was a Christian what about Michael Faraday who was very much a um, believed in the practical implications of James Clark Maxwell's theories. Michael Far Faraday, like Sir Bernard's dad, just happened to be a preacher. You could talk about Max Planck. You could. The list goes on and on. And today, there are many, many scientists that are beginning to believe that the universe. Uh, is not has not just come into being by chance and that it's just just happens to be a lucky planet but they're beginning to believe today that not only is this planet that we're on conducive to producing all the incredible life that we see around us but this planet is also a viewing platform to look at the rest of the universe that we've been put on a planet that is the only place in the solar system where we can see a perfect total eclipse from, where the moon and the sun look exactly the same size. Even though the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, it's exactly 400 times further away. But it's through observing the total eclipses of the sun that we've discovered many things about the universe, including Einstein's theory. There was a book that was written 
uh, one or two years ago now called The Eerie Silence. And it was written by a guy that worked at Jodrell Bank for a long time. And the, the idea of the book is obviously that they've been, that this, this is part of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial life forms. And after many, many years of trying to search for extraterrestrial life forms, they've never, they've never found one discernible language that's come from above. And so he called the book The Eerie Silence. But the amazing thing is, for me, maybe we're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking for discernible language out there when the one place where there's discernible language is here. It says in Psalm 115, I think it's uh, verse 116, that the heaven of heavens is for God, but the earth has been created for man. There's something about this earth which is absolutely unique. The scientists say that it's been put into a Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. It's got plenty of water. It's been put between two spiral arms in the Milky Way so that it, you, we can both view the Milky Way but also view all the other galaxies around us. The size of the moon and where the moon is makes sure that that angle stays constant. We have a, an electromagnetic field around the Earth which shades us from all the harmful rays. It's not only perfect for producing life but it's perfect for observing the universe it has a transparent atmosphere and so many planets you can't see through that if if anybody were to live on them which is obviously impossible because you'd be dead but if you were to live on them, you would never even see the stars because the atmosphere of course is uh, opaque but our atmosphere allows us to see into the universe so that according to Romans chapter 1 we're without excuse the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands well folks I believe that the one discernible language in the whole of the universe that shows that there really is a designer that there really is a God is found inside of every single one of us it's found in the birds that you can hear chirping now the trees the grass and also in every single living thing there's a hundred trillion cells something like that inside of every human being it's enough DNA to stretch if it were all pulled out to the Sun and back four times so there was a book written that said the eerie silence there's nothing discernible out there Carl Sagan once said you know if we could just find one discernible sound something that told us that there was extraterrestrial life out there we know that there was life but well, here we are on this earth and every living thing has within it a language that Bill Gates said is a language it is a computer code it's far more complex than anything that we've ever written however it is a language and it's the language that builds us up and constructs us and makes us exactly what we are it says in Psalm 139 that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made and that everything about us has been written inside of the scroll almost sounds like DNA doesn't it and so I want to give out a challenge just a simple challenge a 21 day challenge and it's simply this the Gospel of John in the Bible this is my one of my first Bibles it's 24 years old now the Gospel of John in the Bible is 21 chapters long and it takes roughly 10 to 15 minutes to read a chapter so here's the challenge that for the next 21 days you set yourself the challenge of reading one chapter of the Gospel of John per day for 21 days after 21 days of reading it, ask yourself the question, who is Jesus?